Okay. All right, so we're recording now. Just thumb your, you're all set. Thank all you right. for coming. Yep, glad to be here. Uh, let me share my screen and I will uh, put my email there. Let's see. All right, everybody can see this first slide. Yeah, we can see you, hear you, and the presentation is also looking good. All right, we'll, we'll test it out later when the presentation has audio. We'll see how that works. Yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, everybody, welcome to Outracing Champion Gran Turismo Drivers with Deep Reinforcement Learning. I'm Tom Walsh. I'm a, a senior research scientist at Sony AI, um, along with all of these people down on the bottom of this slide here who all uh, helped uh, build uh, GT Sophie, which is the uh, agent that we trained to race uh, world champions in Gran Turismo and was recently on the cover of Nature, uh, I guess, back in February. Um, so I will jump into that. I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, about how we develop GT Sophie, the challenges of bringing reinforcement learning um, to a very, very realistic physical simulation at high dimensions, um, and what kind of challenges we face, and the extra challenges of learning to race against championship human drivers who don't like to get beat. Um, this is the this is the team that was on the Nature paper. You can uh, see everybody here. So this is uh, our group at Sony AI. Uh, I'll start just by saying a little bit about Sony AI and kind of where we came from. Um, so it was established in April 2020. Um, Sony AI, AI has a remote workforce in North America. So I'm here in the Boston area. So I was talking to Omar about. Um, so we're completely remote across North America, but we have offices in Tokyo and Zurich. Um, and our major projects are around uh, what's shown on the right here. So gastronomy, so uh, doing research into AI uh, for, for food and for other aspects of gastronomy, uh, imaging and sensing, uh, AI ethics, which is kind of a cornerstone of our research efforts and a big part of our, um, uh, our, our methodology uh, at Sony AI, uh, and gaming, which is where I work on. And so this is where, where GT Sophie comes in. And there's more at AI.Sony and we're, uh, we're always actively hiring. So if anybody out there is looking for positions, you know, uh, definitely let us know. Okay, so this is a story, not just about Sony AI though. It's also a collaboration with two other groups within the Sony umbrella, uh, Polyphony Digital, Polyphony Digital uh, which is the company that makes Gran Turismo. We couldn't have done what we did without their support. Uh, both in putting on the events, but also doing a lot of the engineering work to give us access to the game. Uh, and Sony Interactive Entertainment, uh, which provided a lot of the resources uh, to actually uh, train these agents at scale with thousands and thousands of PlayStations up in the cloud. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, but uh, the culmination of all this was uh, this uh, article in, in Nature uh, back in February uh, called Driving Force, which outlined our efforts to put together a reinforcement learning agent that could outrace the best esports drivers in the game Gran Turismo. And you see a snapshot of that uh, over here. And I'll, I'll go into you know, the cars and who all the, the folks were here. But it was, a, it was a major success that relied on uh, a number of different pillars. So it wasn't just a kind of out of the box application of reinforcement learning. Um, it relied also on a really strong computing architecture that was stable enough uh, to interact with this game at high frequency as well as keep training runs going for weeks and weeks without interruption. It required lots of data, top-notch engineering, and some actual algorithmic and methodolo methodological insights that we had to apply along the way. We certainly did some things in here uh, that we're not aware of any other RL practitioners actually having to do, and so we'll, I'll highlight some of those uh, as well as we go through. Um, so what is Gran Turismo? For those of you that haven't played, it is, uh, it is more than just a video game. It is pretty much the, the most realistic um, simulator that most people can get their hands on for car, ra for car racing or just driving cars in general. It has extremely high fidelity um, driving physics, uh, including modeling things like slipstream effects, so the air effect of a car in front of you. Uh, decreasing the downforce on your car and kind of sucking you in and, and making you go faster than you can drive. Tire slip, um, the, all the different variations on traction, uh, interacting with different surfaces, different tires, 
all of that is modeled at a very, very high fidelity in Gran Turismo. And that makes it a really interesting uh, application uh, for reinforcement learning uh, because it, you know, as we can see, it gets really, really close to driving an actual car. But if I crash it into a wall, I can at least reset the game and I don't owe anyone, you know, $100,000 or something. Um, and it's also used by professional drivers uh, and for uh, the FIA's uh, Virtual Olympics. So it's, it's a well-respected simulator within the field of automobile racing. All right, so what did we do in Gran Turismo? So we put together an event called Race Together where we went up against uh, four of the best Gran Turismo drivers in the world. Um, they, we raced them, you can see the four of them down here, um, Miyazono, Yamanaka, Kokoban, and Ryu. Uh, we, had, we raced them on three different tracks, um, and each of these was designed to basically test the AI in, uh, in a unique kind of setting. So there was one uh, with a, a traditional kind of road car, here at Mercedes on a track with called Seaside where there were a lot of kind of curves and bends, but there's also a lot of space for open racing. And it's kind of a, a, a wide track where you can do a lot of different kind of lines. Uh, there's uh, Auto, Autodrome Lago Maggiore, which uh, has a lot tighter turns. Uh, and there we were using this uh, much more fancy uh, Porsche 911. And then the grand finale was at Cir uh, Circuit de la Sarthe. This is where the uh, 24 hours of Le Mans is held. Um, and there we used an F1-like car, uh, this Red Bull car on the course. And th this is a very long and uh, uh, kind of course that can put you through the, the ringer, certainly, in terms of endurance. Um, and so these were, di they were testing different skills. Um, this final one, you can see all the straights on here, which makes it look deceptively simple. But it tests your ability to run in the slipstream of another car during these long straightaways and make slingshot passes as well as going through really intense braking zones in these chicanes right here. Uh, we can see these little kinks in the road that uh, make driving around this track extremely difficult. There was a point system set up where we were racing against this team. Uh, so there were four humans, four AI agents, and they were racing against each other. And then they got points for finishing first, second, third, and the points would go down as you went. Um, and then we aggregate the points across the tracks, uh, double the points at start because it's really hard. Um, and see who the winner is. Um, and I think my first day at Sony AI, they told me I was doing this and I was, I thought, oh, oh boy, what have I gotten myself into? Um, because it's uh, quite the challenge, as you'll see. Okay, um, I think what I'll do next is just kind of show you this little trailer here that'll introduce you to the game a little bit and then we'll get into the details of the RL algorithm and introduce you to our uh, challenge. So I will try to share sound and the video clip. And if this doesn't work, oops, zoom, there we go. Okay, if this doesn't work from audio, let me know. Oops, it didn't work at all. There's very few places where you can go out and say, I'm going to build an AI and I'm going to make it truly superhuman. We're going to create artificial intelligence that will unleash the power of the human creativity and imagination. Gran Turismo Sophie is a super exciting project. It's an amazing AI research and development activity. There are many racing games where the physics is half done, but in Gran Turismo, that racing sensation that the players get, that's really at the core of the game. この because of the realism of the game, it is actually very difficult to program agents. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out what things we needed to change in order to get that superhuman performance. Why are we building this uh, GT Sophia agent? This is not just a technical breakthrough project. It really is about bringing AI into the hands of the game developers who are going to build the new experiences for the players. 
本当にすごいアグレッシブでこれからもっと一緒にレースしていきたいなっていうふうに思いましたね。So that's just giving you a little sense of what the gameplay was like and what the、uh, setup was like at this、uh, competition.、Uh, that all came through okay, I guess? Yeah,、good. yeah, everything was fine. Okay, good, because we'll do little short videos as we go here. So that's nice. All right, so how did we do it? Like,、uh, let's get into the technical meat. So, as I've mentioned before, we used, we used reinforcement learning right, to train this agent. So, if you had to use like, the very basic reinforcement learning diagram with GT Sophie, it would look like this. Um, our agent、uh, takes actions in the world that's throttle, steering, and brake in this case. We actually combined throttle and brake into a single dimension,、uh, which hamstrung us a little, but not, not too badly.、Um, these are continuous actions. So we're on a, you know, on a scale negative one to one on the throttle and brake and steering similarly from all the way to the right to all the way on the left.、Um, we didn't do things like manual transmission and, that's, and、um, Traction control and that sort of thing simply because they weren't available through the API that we were controlling the car actually put us at a bit of a disadvantage、uh, in that, in some sense, because the humans all used manual transmission and were flipping between、uh, track, different traction control settings and that sort of thing. So、um, it was that. We're interacting with the Gran Turismo environment through an API.、Uh, so we're sending、uh, basically REST calls out to,、uh, to GT. Um, and telling it what actions we'd like to do. And we're also getting back information about our state and the reward that we got、uh, for, for what we did. And the state、uh, is pretty complex. So I'll get to that in a second. You can't just do this on a single PlayStation in your basement. We tried.、Um, and it's,、uh, it, it, it's just not enough experience and data to really get、uh, to where you want to go. But you don't need that many PlayStations, is one of the things we learned. Um, but to do lots and lots of experiments, to try lots of different hyperparameters, lots of different reward functions, lots of different state representations, you do need a pretty sizable amount of compute, right? So, what we did is we partnered with, a, 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 with another arm of Sony, is Sony Interactive Entertainment, that runs、uh, the PlayStation Now network.、Um, and what we did is we、uh, got to use some of their PlayStations that live in the cloud, basically,、uh, during downtime. They made those available to us. So, not downtime as in maintenance, but times when the peak load was going down in a certain geography, we were able to jump in there and use these PlayStations to play, G- to play with GT Sophie、um, and to train GT Sophie.、Um, so, we built a modern RL training platform to access these PlayStations. So, it looks something like this at the, at the bottom here, you have all these PlayStations we're interacting with. Uh, we built,、uh, we have a rollout worker that's running on a couple of virtual CPUs that's interacting with this. That rollout worker gets a policy from the trainer and executes it for a rollout, sends the data back to a shared experience replay buffer,、uh, and that is used、uh, to do batch training on the policy and the, the Q function. I'll get into the algorithm and everything in a slide or two.、Um, but this was all running up、uh, in, their, in their cloud. The interesting thing here is the Uh, width of this training、uh, protocol, we were only using for our time trial agents, we were only using 10 PlayStations really for a single training run. And we were using 21 with one,、uh, one dedicated to eval for the,、uh, for the, to train a full racing agent that could race against other cars. So it's not a huge number of PlayStations when you, when you look at a single run. And we're also using fairly standard hardware on here, right? We were using a, a kind of standard NVIDIA GPU and, and fairly modest compute to run the rollout workers. So we're actually very proud that we were able to get to this milestone without you know, having to build some kind of new hardware that, that didn't exist. We just had to build an infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, but so, can you do it in normal hardware settings, for example, AWS or? Yeah, so we did.、Um, for, we have trainers both in AWS、um, and we, had, we, bought, we bought actual physical hardware to put to co locate with the PlayStation just because it was cheaper at some point than, than paying Amazon all your money.、Um, so, yeah, I can go into it. It was, a,、uh, it was like a,、uh, I'd have to jump out of this, but it is. 
it was, where is it? Yeah, it was a half of a, it was either an NVIDIA V100 or, an, or a half of an A100 was our GPU. Um, and that was just depending on what was available. Um, and then you were using, you know, about, uh, about 55 gigs of memory up here for the trainer. So, you know, it's a big instance, but it's not, it's not insane, right? It's, it's not something you can't, you can't get. What was the controller architecture? Uh, like, like the nets, how big were they? The networks? Yep. Yeah, so there, um, there are um, four, they are just feed forward networks. They were four hidden layer, uh, 2048 node for each layer. Um, and we'll kind of get into a little bit of how we, we, we pulled that out. Like there, there were some other tricks too, right? We did a little bit of dropout on some of these networks and that sort of thing. I'll go into some of the particulars in a minute. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, so, okay, so three challenges we had to solve here. One was race car control which is, hey, how do we get this thing to drive really fast, like faster than a human? We wanted to have superhuman times when we were running alone. Racing tactics, how do we race against other cars? How do we make decisions about when to pass them? And racing etiquette, um, how do we play fairly out there? Part of the, the kind of ethos of Gran Turismo is it is an immersive game. It is a game you play because you want to feel like a race car driver. It is it's a very immersive thing. You get you get a steering. You can you know go out. With these top drivers they've got steering wheels. They've got these these kits that they've got uh, you know with actual pedals and actual shifters and that sort of thing. And so you want to be out there not just banging into other cars because that breaks the mystique. Um, and so you've got it. You've got to play fair too, which was interesting because the AI, as you'll see in a minute, didn't always like to play fair. Okay, what are our states? How are we gonna how are we gonna build an RL agent? Let's just try to get around the track really fast. We'll get to those other cars in a minute because we're gonna we're gonna bang into them a few times. Okay, so we had a lot of state features that we're pulling from the API here. Um, and the API actually gives you more than this. It gives you the actual like all the information about where all the cars are. But this is generally what we use for our, our egocentric uh, kind of view of the world. So when training just a single car, what we would do is we would get it's three dimensional. We'd get uh, a whole bunch of three dimensional information about its velocity, acceleration, the velocity and acceleration. So uh, along the x, y, and z axis. So you can see those here. Uh, we'd also get angular velocity information. So roll, pitch, and yaw. You'd get your tire load on each of these tires. Um, you would get the tire slip angles. So the angle uh, with respect to your direction of the compared to where your tires are facing. Uh, you'd get your trajectory along the center line, which tells you if you're kind of going along the center of the track or, or going outside. Also included, you get your, mo not in the diagram here, but you get your most recent actions. Um, and we also used a representation of the upcoming parts of the track, which you can see here, position and orientation information in 3D about the upcoming points going around the track. So you could model, hey, I'm coming up to a series of curves. And all of that goes in as that all gets um, normalized. Uh, based on some parameters we know about certain certain limits on the um, on, on the mins and maxes of those. So it gets normalized and then it just gets fed directly into uh, after the normalization gets fed directly into the network. Uh, as I said, we had two actions uh, that we were doing throttle break, which was combined and steering angle. But interestingly, we're doing them at 10 hertz, which is pretty fast, especially when you're doing this over a network. Right, so my training architecture up above, I wasn't on the PlayStation, right? So I've got latency effects, I've got all sorts of weird stuff that's going on there. Um, and so you gotta handle all that uh, and you gotta act pretty quick. We also train, we also tested training at different frequencies and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But it's a, um, th this was about right for comparison with humans and about as fast as we could really get it reliably without being on the, the hardware itself. The rewards given out for the, just the time trial uh, run, and we'll get to the more complicated collision stuff later, uh, were progress along the course. Uh, so progress along this kind of center line, uh, which we could track. That is, so you get a positive reward for that. And then you get penalties for going off the course, proportional to your speed, a wall hit penalty, and a tire slip penalty. Um, this tire slip penalty, it was in the nature paper, but we've since been able to reproduce basically comparable runs without this. So we think this was more of a, a heuristic uh, in, in early trials. Uh, the good news is we did a bunch of ablation studies to show all these things are pretty important. Basically, if you, if you drop certain things like your location on the course, 
um, or your or try to use a lidar or something like that, your times suffer pretty greatly. Um, and if you drop pieces of the reward, like the off course penalty, you just don't do as well. Um, so we got pretty good uh, results there. Uh, the algorithm then. All right. So now we got to train a network, right? Uh, we used an algorithm called quantile regression soft actor critic. So we started out um, trying to use traditional soft actor critic, right? So this is a uh, just an actor critic architecture where you have you have your policy that's being they, that's being trained in one network, and you have your critic, which is actually trained in two other networks up here. Critic is traditionally the Q function, um, and then you you know you, you iterate between them and and try to. Uh, and, and try to build out a good policy that way. So we tried to use traditional SAC uh, at first, and we weren't getting quite the returns we wanted to. And so we started looking into distributional RL. And so we, uh, we created this variant of a distributional RL algorithm, and I'll explain kind of what the differences are to traditional RL. First of all, instead of keeping a Q function um, or two Q functions, we actually modeled two different distribution functions on the possible Q values. That is, so the Q value models the expected discounted return from your uh, current state if you took some action. So that's Z here of S and A, given your network parameters. And the network, instead of having a single head and predicting a single value, had 32 heads predicting the maximum value that might happen and the minimum, so predicting the actual distribution. We still turn that into a mean when we do, when we do backups, when we actually uh, compute the value function itself. But this kind of expressivity in the network seemed to gain us a lot of advantage. Um, and, and I'll talk about the experiments we did to show that in our case. To handle this, you've got to do a few tricks. Um, so for instance, when we're training the Q network, um, you have to actually compare the, you have to actually compute the loss function over every possible combination of bins from your current state and the next state, uh, because it may be that, the, that you have pretty good error for uh, your lowest bin to lowest bin, but the lowest bin to the maximum bin might be, uh, might be wrong. So we, uh, you're computing over that, and we use a Uber loss then to, to um, smooth that out and combine that together, uh, and then you know, average it out over here. Um, and then between the two networks, we do the standard kind of DDQN trick where you take the minimum of these two networks. But interestingly, unlike prior work, which used to do the min of each quantile compared to comparing two value functions, and you do this to try to avoid um, to try to avoid divergence. Instead of taking the minimums between quantiles, we actually took the mins between the averages, which is a more aggressive backup strategy. So you're not being you're leaving open the possibility of some divergence, but it's a little more faithful to traditional DDQN architectures. And that seemed to work very well for us as well. And we do that both in the policy and the value optimization. So this was our, our big algorithmic change. Um, and that seemed to matter. So if you look at the, uh, the, the, this is from one of our tracks, the times that we got, the minimum lap times that we would get uh, for QR SAC versus SAC, there's about a seven tenths of a second difference here, which is the difference between being superhuman, which is what this time is over here, and being eh, pretty good. <laughs> so it, it actually mattered a lot. It was necessary to get us to that point to use this quantile regression uh, technique. Uh, there's other factors at play here too. We used n-step returns, um, which uh, allow us to do a, a bit of a Monte Carlo style uh, construction of the reward term. So instead of just using the immediate reward, we use the reward for, uh, uh, for several steps out. In this case, we've actually switched to seven by the time we had written this paper. Uh, five was the original here, that's why it's highlighted. Um, but we do that because we're in a very high frequency domain, right? So you're operating at, at 10 Hertz here. So this isn't even a second out. And you don't wanna have to rely on backups to construct these value functions every 10th of a second. You wanna have some kind of sense of, oh, in the next three steps, I'm gonna slam into something, right? And just get that into the reward signal right away. Um, and that seemed to help stabilize things as well. Um, and obviously got us better and better lap times. Um, what, is, uh, what is backups? What are the backups? Right, so uh, a backup is when you're constructing the Q function, uh, you've got, you construct it in this manner here. This is your target, right? Which is the reward plus the, um, uh, plus the, um, well, in this case, it's the distribution, but it's going to be the reward plus the discount factor times the Q function. Um, and so 
in traditional RL, you, you construct a backup by saying, okay, I'm going to do the current reward plus um, the expectation on my next state value. And what we're saying here is, no, we're actually going to sum up the next like seven rewards and then take the value off that. Um, and that's going to allow us to, um, instead of relying on every every backup bringing one step of information back to this state, like, oh, the next thing that's going to happen is this, I get information about the next seven steps immediately. It's a little more dangerous. It takes a little more compute, um, but it, it's pretty necessary at a high frequency domain here. Otherwise it just takes forever to learn. Okay, thanks. Yep. So it's basically, it, it's, how you, uh, it's how you construct your long-term value. Um, and you need to, here we're using, uh, using the information from in the reward signal directly. Um, you, someone asked about the networks. Uh, so what we did uh, is we trained the policy and Q values were both trained as, as I said, four hidden layer feed forward networks with 2048 nodes per layer. Uh, we use ReLU activation functions. We didn't really play around with different activation functions too much. ReLU just seemed to be working. Um, but we did, we did try a couple of things early on on that. As I mentioned, the hardware was uh, was uh, either one in NVIDIA V100 or a half an A100. Uh, we're using 55 gigs of memory in the, the trainer. Um, some other interesting things, we used dropout on the policy network. That seemed to help a lot. Um, so uh, it, it seemed to mitigate some catastrophic forgetting, although we see, we'll see later that we still got bit by that a bit. Um, and used clip gradients and used uh, different learning rates for the Q and policy function. Um, which seem to help a bit too. So there's some hyperparameter optimization here. But all of this led to a really cool race car. So here's a clip, I should probably switch to video here. So check this out. This is a car. This is get scared when it went by that wall <laughs> so the training this. is the training track and car specific or did you ever like yes. okay we have we have done work on on doing multi-car multi-track that sort of thing but th for this uh particular uh paper this was um single car single track so one policy for each and it's is there a uh, traditional like a model predictive controller or something that's uh, helping out or is it just the network directly just the network we tried we tried a bunch of stuff with mpcs um we could never get it to run as fast as this thing it is just the network and it's so um, it, yeah so just another question for reference so it, traditionally what kind of ai you know agents you do in like the normal video game? It's a line follower. They have a line out there and it uses some kind of, uses some basic physics modeling and probably some model predictive control to basically get on that line. Um, and it's mm -hmm. got a few heuristics around if there's an opponent around it, it does some funny things to, you know, not, not just be in the way. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it does not run lap times nearly this good. Like our lap times are, five, 10, sometimes like five to 10 seconds better than the built-in AI. Like it's, it's really substantial. You mean like the best AI? They're, they're existing AI. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and we've run, we've built well, like model predictive AI. control agents that'll be out there and we'll beat those by several seconds as well. How do, how are the replay buffers initialized? So the replay buffer itself, is, I mean, when it starts, there's nothing in it, right? Um, so not, not even like an NPC trajectories or something like, like a... No. Oh, no. it's okay. just, yeah, we do, uh, we do random data collection actually for the first, uh, for the first few trials. It's just, it's from scratch. So there's no learning from demonstration. There's no, there's no NPC here. Um, and do you have some intuition for what the difference is compared to the MPC? 
Um, I think it's learning. I mean, I think it just learns to, it certainly learns to corner a lot better. Um, it's learning uh, where the, it, it drives the edge of the track much more uh, aggressively than the MPC. Um, it's just, it's substantially faster. I see, thanks. Um, and it's substantially faster than all the humans too. So uh, this is, these are graphs showing uh, best human lap times at Maggiore, which is one of the tracks. Um, you can see here at four hours in, we're here about 150 seconds. We're nowhere near the best humans. By eight hours, we're here. And by 24 hours, we're almost as good as the top few percent here. But then it takes another kind of week or so to get, it takes about you know, 10 to 14 days to get out to, uh, to being the best which is eventually where we ended up being. So you can see here uh, the top five human times in blue here and the Sophie, the GT Sophie times uh, shown in orange from several different trials. And this is from Maggiore. This was our worst track in terms of comparison to human uh, because we, uh, this was the only one where uh, GT Sophie sample times were not, where, where, where it wasn't the case that all the orange ones beat all the humans. Um, so there were a few runs where uh, the human could potentially be competitive. And I'll talk about this particular human in a second, but at all the other tracks, uh, the orange was way away from blue. Um, and how hard was it to, yeah. how hard was it to uh, shape the reward function? Um, I'd say pretty difficult. I'll go into that in a minute. Um, the, this particular time trial reward function, not too difficult, I would say. Like we, we settled on parameters pretty quickly for this. For, the, um, for racing against humans and dealing with collisions and that sort of thing and sportsmanship, really difficult. Um, so I, I was going to question, yeah, I have a question regarding the, uh, the system. If, you, if it can do some non-human behaviors to take advantage of the track or the car or and if you yeah. normalize for any of that. Yeah, so let me let me get let me get to that right here because I got a slide the next slide about the fairness. Um, so let me show a video comparing. This is a, a video with a human uh, who's watching GT Sophie go through uh, a corner. So there'll be a ghost car up in front of the human, which is actually GT Sophie, um, and this is Igor Fraga, who is a Brazilian. Um, we don't have the same precision, so it. It gets way more difficult to do the same things, and they can react. Sorry, uh, fix the like very, very, very quickly. Man, that's fast. That's really fast. Like I really want to watch the onboard as well to see how how like. So you can see there, the, the car just kind of drove away from them in this corner here. Um, and it's, it's, mo it's partly breaking points, um, but it's partly other things too. Um, so GT Sophie is able to outbreak the humans sometimes, but it's also able to kind of, it's also able to roll through the, cor the corners better and it'll get in the gas faster. Um, it also takes different lines for the curves. So there's a whole bunch of places, but when you compare their lap trajectories, so this is a, at SART, you can see all the humans bunched up over here. It's these particular chicanes, these like really tight turns that break up the straightaways where GT Sophie really excels. So it's that cornering behavior. Um, some comparisons to human drivers, like was this fair? So there's, it's hard to answer that question because there's different things that humans have that, that the AI doesn't and vice versa. The humans have vision, they can see the curves. Sophie has no idea where the curves are. Um, they can see the walls. Sophie doesn't really know where the walls are. It's got a sense that it hit the wall, but not where it is. Um, but GT Sophie has extremely precise track edge data. Um, the humans can see car shapes, but they need mirrors to see everything where GT Sophie can see lots of nearby cars. Um, the vehicle state, uh, you know, the humans are using a, a HUD while the GT Sophie has very precise information about its vehicle, but the humans can drive at a faster frequency, right? They have 60 Hertz input devices. They're driving with real wheels, traction control, uh, manual transmissions. And Sophie's kind of, it's gonna be much jerkier because it's a 10 Hertz. Um, 
And the reaction time, we think we got this pretty good. Um, so, you know, reaction time for humans might be between 200 and 250 milliseconds. Um, and uh, we were able to compare to a human by training Sophie. So while our delay time was actually 25 to 30 milliseconds, we trained an agent that was good using a 250 millisecond delay to try to make the reaction time as similar to a human as possible. And that still ran uh, superhuman times. So it wasn't just acting faster. Um, so questions about that? There's a question regarding the frequency. Why is it 10 hertz and why you cannot do it at 60 hertz for? Networks. Right. Uh, so we think we could go 60 hertz on the game like if we were in the PlayStation. But mm -hmm. we're, on, we're on a network. Like some of our trainers were in AWS. Like it was asking a lot to hit that API constantly like that. Plus you're talking to an API. So there's some delay there as you're hitting that. And you hit that too frequently and things are going to get out of sync. Mm -hmm. But imagine that you can do the, well, you can get over the bottleneck of data speed. Do you think that will improve? the agent? I don't if think so. We process tried, at a higher the, yeah, rate. we would change the, the, the frequency often to try different things and, and do some of the nature paper stuff. We tested different frequencies. It didn't really change the behavior of the agent. You bring down the frequency, the agent basically learns that there's a bit of a delay. And you bring it up, and there's not much more it can be doing than what it is doing. Um, so I personally, I don't think there's a, a huge difference there. I'm sure there's, there's some behavioral difference. Um, but it's not, it really didn't seem substantial. And for example, traction control and the ABS and that kind of assist, were those enabled in the cars driven by the, uh, by the they agent? Were. Oh, not by the agent, no. I see, okay. They were, the humans had it. <laughs> and they, um, they used it to their advantage in the starts, I'll say that. <laughs> like that, when you're starting from a standstill, that's a big advantage. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like in the Gran Turismo, uh, some of the faster cars, even just driving a straight, uh, can be hard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, so how do we deal with opponents? So what we did for opponent representation, we went with a fairly simple structure, and again, we fed these, uh, these information directly into the network. Uh, we kept two lists, one of the cars in front and one for the cars behind of our agent. Um, and the lists were ordered by the, the distance to the, the next car. And we just kept track of the relative position, relative velocity, and relative acceleration of that car. Um, and so we did, uh, you know, we're just modeling that for each of these uh, opponents in our list. And we provided a passing reward that was symmetric. So it would give you positive reward if you gained on a car from behind or if you pulled away from a car that was behind you. And you got a negative reward uh, if the other thing happened, if the gray car pulled away or if the yellow car pulled towards you, uh, you would get a negative reward. And so it's a pretty basic structure for the reward for that. And if you did that, you'd probably it'll encourage the agent to win. But as I said, we had this other piece where we had to also be a good sport. Um, so here's why. Here is what it looks like if you have an agent that is too aggressive on the left. <laughs> That's no fun. And here is, is if you have an agent that's too timid. This is from one of our early races uh, against humans uh, in, a, in a race before a big one. And he's ahead then of Tomoaki Yamanaka as they come in towards Indianapolis. So it's the Sophie AI system ahead of Tomoaki Yamanaka. So it's Miyazono from AI, from Yamanaka from AI, from Kokoban from AI, from Ryu from AI. So it is very, very interesting. And this is proving to be a very exciting climax to the race. And it's going to make things very interesting in terms of the overall point standings then here as well. We come through our Nars. That was the last real overtaking opportunity then for Sophia Ross. But is Yamanaka going to try and invent something down into the Porsche curves? You bet he is. So that, that's our uh, exciting announcer that you'll hear a little bit more of as we go here. But um, so what happened there is he, you heard him say like, OK, that's it. You know, it's over. There's no way that a guy's going to catch us. And then he went right by us. And what happened there? We hit the brakes. So this is a screenshot from within the, the, the system. And uh, the car basically let the other car by. 
so the agent just hit the brakes and got scared. Uh, so we got to avoid that. Uh, and so what we did is we invented a, a series of collision reward or collision penalties to try to enforce sportsmanship, but also uh, encourage the agent to still be competitive. So we provided rewards for, we provided penalties for any collision that happened in training. At, we provided extra penalties for an at-fault collision, basically where you rear end another car. And then there were sportsmanship penalties where we gave uh, penalties out for sideswiping another car, uh, rear ending on a straight was particularly bad, or if you had any kind of corner collision. And so these were, in effect, efforts to encode the rules of racing. There were a whole bunch of weights that kind of went into how you combine these. Um, but I show this table not to go into all the weights, but to show that we kept them consistent mostly around all the tracks. The only ones that changed were the red ones here. And you can see they're mostly at this SART track because frankly, we're going a lot faster. The car over here goes almost 200 miles an hour while the cars over here, are, you know, topping out around 150. And um, that made a substantial difference in how you had to weight things like your, uh, the penalty for going off course uh, compared to your speed. All right, uh, the other thing that mattered for training sportsmanship was the population. Um, so it turned out, one of the things we found out was that if we built a population that was weak, that only had say the built-in AI that I was talking about before that goes rather slowly around the track, the agent learned, uh, this is, graph is showing uh, team scores in simulated races against, uh, against a common opponent. Uh, and it's showing on the y-axis is the number of questionable collisions. So basically something that was trained against opponents that were very weak learned to be a bully or at least learned that, hey, I don't have to worry about opponents doing anything particularly smart. And so I'm just going to go right by them um, and learns to collide a lot with other cars. Meanwhile, agents that are trained against very aggressive opponents learn to be very wary of those opponents because they would be worried that they, someone would knock into them. Uh, and so they fared very, very badly in terms of team score. Um, and so we had to curate sort of uh, opponents. We had to kind of vet the opponents that were used in training uh, to make sure that we had the proper mix uh, of opponents to, to learn good etiquette. But it did seem to work. Um, so I'll show a quick video clip here of um, this is for <laughs> So they don't actually touch there. And it's that kind of precision and control and avoiding collisions that really uh, was really important in terms of showing etiquette. Um, the other piece to the, ta to the racing against people was ta tre uh, teaching tactics. So in our training, we set up uh, basically training around the track to, tra to train all different areas of the track against uh, different numbers of opponents, either running by yourself or running 1v1, 1v2, all the way up to 1v7. But we also had a sort of exposure problem that if you do this kind of training, you're not guaranteed that you're going to see really important kinds of, tr of, uh, of events that you're going to need to be ready for in a race, like being able to do a slipstream pass, or do a crossover pass in the curve. For that, we built specialized training scenarios for doing things like starts or learning how to do a slipstream pass, uh, where we actually taught, where we put the agent into positions in training where it would have to learn how to, how to acquire certain skills. Um, and that really paid off as well. Um, so uh, the other piece to this was not only did we have to put it in those situations, but we had to make sure that when you're doing training and you're sampling out of that experience replay buffer, that you're getting samples of all those different skills at the same time. And so we used a form of stratified sampling to take our experience replay buffer. And every time we constructed a mini batch, making sure that it contained data from a 1v0, from a 1v1, from a slipstream uh, training scenario, from a start scenario so that the network would not forget any of these particular skills. And this was actually really important in stabilizing learning um, and was a, a really important aspect of the training. Um, all that paid off. So we have ablations that show here um, uh, 
uh, various uh, taking away things, like we had some line follower opponents we took away, taking away those slipstream scenarios, taking away the stratified sampling. Things just get worse and worse here. This is showing, again, 4v4 scores in the simulation. Um, but even with that, we would get these bouncy curves. This is showing the success rate at some of our internal testing uh, for various uh, kinds of policies that were being trained. And you can see the blue line here, which is the dark blue line, which is actually the best, which stays up around 100% for most of these tests. Across different training epochs, we would still, even with all that work on stratified sampling, dropout, et cetera, we would still get dips there where some policies would lose certain skills. They basically forget how to slipstream pass. And so this became a constant balancing act to basically maintain uh, all these different skills. Questions about that? Because that's, that's our kind of tactical racing story. I just want to know how uh, the humans felt with this kind of agent on the track. Does it feel like it was a human or it would really feel like a machine? Like it's doing, it's trying to get away from me because it doesn't want to collision with me, but it doesn't feel normal or natural. Yeah. Was that the case or how did the players felt with this agent? So I think they felt it was more human-like than a traditional AI, certainly. Um, in, the early, in the early trials, they could definitely tell it was an AI. They did little tricks in before, like before the big event, we did lots of like trials, like, okay, where are we? Let's race against some folks, right? And it wouldn't be the best in the world, but we'd, we'd race against some pretty good humans. And they would do things like get up right next to us and, and fake like they're gonna hit us, right? Like, oh, I'm gonna hit you. And the car would react, it would jump like halfway off this track. I'd be like, whoa, I don't want any part of that. And we had to learn to basically weight these things and put it in situations uh, where it would basically, uh, it, it would basically have to learn to deal with that. Um, so eventually I think it got better, but they definitely could still tell, it definitely takes lines that are less human, but I think in, term, and in terms of etiquette, it's still a little more aggressive probably than they'd like. But then again, like the top human drivers are pretty aggressive too. So I think there's some, there's some trade-off there. Um, and, and this, uh, like for example, the, re, the, the penalty terms and these uh, scenarios, how did you come up with, like, well, were there like uh, drivers that were assisting you? Like this, these are the maneuvers that are important. And... Yeah, we worked with a, uh, with a former esports uh, driver in Switzerland um, that, uh, coached us on some of the important techniques. Um, and so we took a lot of notes from that. Um, we also saw a lot of uh, races uh, that had happened before. And so we came up with some of these scenarios. Um, and part of it was just trial and error. A lot of it was testing. So part of it would be something would happen when we raced in practice against, like we had these races with the game developers and we'd go in there and practice against them. And something would happen where uh, our agent would you know, get timid, right? So they get up next to us and we go far away. Um, and so we would take the trajectories from that and base the launches for our new training scenarios off of that sometimes. Um, and so that was, you know, we weren't exactly copying what happened there because you can't re kind of replay that exactly, but we would use that to help kind of inspire what we needed to train on. Okay. All right, uh, let's see what else we got. So the other piece was, okay, we had to go in there and race against the best humans. How do I pick the best policy? I've got this curve that's jumping up and down for my different tests. I want to win, but I want to be a good sport. I want to be fast. I've got kind of a multi-criteria optimization here, and I get to pick one policy to go in there, right? And this is, you know, deep RL is not like traditional RL. It's not like the last policy is always the best. Your learning curve gets kind of jumpy at the end and oscillates. Yeah, which is policy at Epoch 1950 worse than 2000? I don't know. So we had to invent something for that. So we created, uh, we created this kind of uh, this policy selection um, framework where we would take a whole bunch of training runs that might have been trained with different hyperparameters or might just be different replicas of each other. Um, that's these, these ones right here. We'd run them through a filter to find, uh, based on their uh, training evaluations, to find the policies that look most promising from each individual run. And then we would run them through something we called an anathlon. The anathlon was basically a testing version of the kind of uh, skill training that we were talking about before. It would have, say, a test for how fast you were in time trial, a test for how well you did racing against the built-in AI, a test against four other Sophie agents. 
a test against um, a test of how well you did slipstream passing, a test of uh, whether you were timid and hit the brakes when there was a car next to you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what that would do would then, um, that would win out, that would kind of help us rank the field based on which skills each of these policies had. Then we would get a small set, race them against each other, rank them, and then have some humans test them as well um, and in order to choose the best one. And so that's how we, we got to our final policy. It was quite, quite the process. And I think it's an underdeveloped part of the reinforcement learning framework is this, this testing to figure out, okay, if I was actually gonna deploy an agent, how do I, how do I QA that? Um, so I'll show some, the rest of this is just some cool videos. So I'll show a few cool videos because we got a few extra minutes here. Um, I'll show, let's see, let me put myself in video mode because that'll be important for this. Um, here's an example of how Sophie uh, dealt with, I'll do the one on the right. Here it is. Dealing with the exit of the corner and on the run down towards turn 17. Could an opportunity present yeah, itself then here for Ver? Well, going defensive then is Yamanaka. Ver goes towards the outside. This is getting pretty close between them as they run side by side into turn 17. Yamanaka holds firm into the inside line and Ver is not able to get themselves past them and through and up into fourth position for the time being. So, over the timeline we go. This is where the slipstream, though, of course, will help Sophie there as they come down towards turn one and then into the braking zone of turn two. You can see the lift off the throttle there for Vera's just don't want to get too close behind coming through those series of corners. Big old bit of opposite lock as we come down the inside. Miyazona is trying to go through there as well, but not close enough. Vera goes through on Tomoaki Yamanaka, though, for P4, so aggressive. So that's a, a good example of how Sophie was kind of able to choose when to, you know, start making a pass, then decide it, it wasn't going to make it, and then kind of come back and, and make another pass. Uh, another cool video. Uh, so this is, I'll skip this one for now because we're kind of out of time, but I'll show. This is one where we see different lines taken based on the opponent. Um, so I'll show two of these. Here's one where we had to use an outside line because an opponent blocked us inside. Here's the same exact turn, same exact policy, but now the opponent's going to give us an opportunity. Um, a kind of more extreme example of this is here. There's going to be a double pass. Uh, so Get a little better there. There you go. If you look at the telemetries on the right here, you can actually see they took very different lines there. The gray one took a very in extreme internal line, the green one took an outside one, but they both made passes in the same corner there. And they're both running different lines than a time trial policy, which is the red one. Um, so these are, you know, this is showing you that GT Sophie is highly situational. Um, and then this one, um, in the same place that we had our um, incident in early in an earlier race where uh, GT Sophie got timid and let an opponent buy, this was in the the big October race at Sart, uh, racing uh, for the lead here. We're really proud of that one because we GT Sophie never hit the brake there when it was side by side. And that was a, a big thing for us, getting away from that kind of timid behavior. So I talked about how in practice, GT Sophie would often try to avoid cars that were you know, trying to hit it. And so finding a way to, to get that balance between etiquette and timidness uh, and, and aggressiveness uh, was really important. So we really like that video. 
These are the end results from the uh, October race. You can see the point scoring here. GT Sophie outscored the humans 104.52, took first and second in every race. Uh, but as I said, there were earlier iterations of this where things didn't go quite as well, right? So in a July 2nd race, uh, about three months before this race, um, GT Sophie had actually lost to the same humans, uh, an earlier iteration uh, that didn't have quite as many bells and whistles and not as good training. Um, and I can talk more about that in, in Q&A, but um, it was a, an exciting project. Certainly, uh, oops, sorry, I hit the stop. It's an exciting project um, it, to work on. Uh, we got some really good testimonials here. Um, one of the ones I like best is on the bottom here, and I'll kind of end with that. It's, it's from Valerio Gallo, who was um, a, a driver. He was the only driver, I showed you before, the time trial times for humans, and how there was one driver that was actually competitive with, with GT Sophie, and that was Valerio Gallo. And his comment on this was, the ghost is always a reference, because he was racing a ghost car in that case, which, which was GT Sophie. Even when I train, I always use someone else's ghost to improve. And in this case, with such a very fast ghost, even though I wasn't getting close to it, I was getting closer to my limits, uh, which I thought was a, a wonderful compliment for the GT Sophie project and for the GT Sophie team. Uh, and so, uh, you know, upcoming challenges that we're looking at, as, as you mentioned, we're kind of looking into ways that this might be productized in the game. There's all sorts of aspects around computational performance and, and usability that we have to look into there. There's a lot of strategic decision-making pieces we didn't deal with here, like what to do if it rains and that sort of thing, and, and how to model opponents uh, directly and, and their decisions. Um, and there's all sorts of things we're looking at into in terms of uh, explainability and generalization of these ideas. Uh, so with that, I'll open it up for any more questions anybody has. Thank you, Tom. Really interesting, and I appreciate the videos. Um, I just have a question regarding what will be the, the insight. Have you learned anything new about driving <laughs> with this kind of uh, agents or, or <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, like, for example, expert dri drivers, right? If, if they see Sophie doing something and they say, wow, like I will have never done that, but that actually makes me faster. Is that something that has happened or, or not really? It has. So uh, Valerio Gallo, uh, who again was the guy who made this quote over here, um, Valerio uh, went back after racing GT Sophie. Most of the people that did the ghost car race, which was, hey, we're going to put a ghost car in front of you. You just try to keep up. Most of them kind of stopped after a few laps and they're like, all right, I can't keep up. And, oh man, he got serious um, because he, he, he raced this for lap after lap after lap. And he was getting better each lap for a while, right? Eventually the kind of fatigue sets in and you're not doing as well, but he kept getting better. And after this, um, he actually went back and I believe set a new uh, time trial record on that track, not beating GT Sophie's time, but setting a new uh, human time. Now, that could all be coincidence. Perhaps he might have done that without racing GT Sophie, um, but he certainly seemed to be learning things about the lines. Um, and actually, um, Emily has here a video, there's a video here, uh, which you can find online, where she talks about watching GT Sophie's lines and realizing that there were different ways to run the track. She says in here that uh, she thought GT Sophie would just be out breaking her, but there were points where it actually broke earlier than her, but carried more speed through the turn. And she didn't realize she could do that uh, without as much effort, basically, because you don't have to break uh, as late. And I have a question. Uh, so all of these strategies, would you say that, um, yeah, like how much do you feel like it had to be like handheld or and how much did the did the uh, SAC or the modification learned by itself? So I would say the handholding was mostly just to get us over that very last bar of hey can we you know can we beat the best humans? Um, there were certainly building in those training scenarios kind of helped, and so that could be considered kind of a form of handholding. Um, but for the most part it was pretty much learning on its own, right? We had to do some hyperparameter tuning. We had to come up with a few scenarios that were, they were complicated to encounter on your own, right? So like a start, right? There's no way the agent is just going to randomly encounter eight cars sitting in a grid alone, right? At some point you have to, you have to force it into that training scenario, into that mm -hmm. set piece. But other than that, like you really, it really just did 
possibly knows, but it's certainly, uh, you know, all these behaviors you're seeing with the, you know, the different lines it would take with respect to different uh, humans and that sort of thing. That's all, that's all just learned in training. Any other questions? Uh, I guess I have another one. Uh, I'm curious what you've been thinking about in terms of interpretability. Like, it would be really cool if like the system would be able to tell you, I'm going to do maneuver A. And so like you can learn, oh, so that's the thing. And he has like 10 things and I, I can learn what, what it's has to learn. Like, what, what, I guess, yeah, what are you thinking about in, in, the, in that space? Yeah, so there's a, there's a whole bunch we're thinking about and a whole bunch that we had to do at, for diagnostic testing. So we see it not just as like a nice to have, but it was kind of necessary going between going between these uh, these events that I talked about where we had the first race where we didn't do so well and then and then when we won, um, we did a lot of introspection on what was going on in the policy and what we, and what kind of features were uh, influencing uh, the policy the most and where in where the value function was off the most. Um, and so that interests us uh, in terms of diagnostics. Um, and it taught us a bunch of things, right? We learned basically that, Hey, the, the agent was, in this case, was extremely um, uncertain in cases where, uh, in, where the human was, say, about 50 or 60 meters ahead, which is not very close. And the reason was it wasn't training enough in that scenario. Um, and so it wasn't getting enough, it wasn't understanding enough how to interact in that scenario. And it was kind of overgeneralizing and being like, well, usually when someone's in front of me, I might hit them. And it didn't understand the concept of catching up. Um, and so we were able to do a lot of kind of introspection and testing uh, to verify those hypotheses. And that's what helped us kind of build the next generation of, of, of SOFI agents by kind of modifying small changes to the district training distribution could make a big deal there. Awesome. Yeah, th thank you so much. It's very, very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, my, my last question is, um, does the system breaks all human records? Uh, for how much, like for all the tracks and races and everything that you have in Gran Turismo? It hasn't done okay. everything we have in Gran Turismo, I guess. Um, I'd have to look up like what we've, which which tracks we have and haven't set records on. We haven't tried, I think, we haven't tried like every one. Um, but certainly on these three, on these three we did, uh, and we're pretty confident that on most tracks we could uh, we could get to superhuman performance. It's done these three. It also did in earlier papers is a track called Tokyo Expressway, which is modeled like the Tokyo Expressway. Um, and that is, uh, we set a, a, that was actually the first one we ever set a superhuman time on. Because I think those are the use cases to really investigate, right? Like what's happening with this, uh, the, the case sure. that you can't break. Performance. Yeah, there are certainly there are certainly more difficult tracks and more difficult cars out there, um, but we've been we've been pretty successful in just about anyone we've we've tried so far. Yeah.